few notes inserting here before the video. If you're just listening, I think you should be okay. It's better with the images, but I can't show any movie clips. Movie reviewer that can't show movie clips. And also, guys, per the time of the video, incredible synchronicity. This movie is about chasing signs, symbols, synchronicities. I had a personal synchronicity, and I watched it, and now the runtime of the video, which I was unaware of. Hey, guys, it's Matt. This is not your classic truth in movies review, but um, it is definitely worth talking about. Under the Silver Lake. Under the Silver Lake with, is this Andrew Garfield? Yeah, Andrew Garfield. One of these actors that has been in several things you've known was that uh, partner to Mark Zuckerberg in The Social Network, and he was the S Spider-Man, but you don't know his name. You know, it's like, who is this guy? You see him all over the place. It's like... Um, Took me 20 years to figure out this guy's name was Shia LaBeouf. Turns out to be one of the biggest freaks of all time. Just a completely used Illuminati puppet. Probably, uh, you know, lies naked for Lady Gaga for uh, spirit cooking. I don't, you know, I don't take that seriously, guys. That that spirit cooking thing, all the truthers were led down that rabbit hole on purpose by design. They might do their weird crap behind the scenes in their eyes wide shut parties, but what we were meant to see, again, if we were meant to see it, and then it comes out on truth channels, that means it was put out there for us, and it's bullcrap. So it doesn't mean they don't do the creepy shit or similar creepy shit, but you, we, you've been over that. So this Andrew Garfield, guys, here's the, here's the thing with this. It is weird. I don't even know where to go with this. 10% will love this movie. Um, but I'll try to describe what kind of 10% would love it. 90% just might be like, well, I don't really ever want to see that again. And 10% really will find it bad, really bad, disturbing scenes, um, real creepy stuff, uh, masturbation scenes. I mean, I just, I don't, put it this way. I guess I'm glad I got through it, but I never want to see this movie again. I would say it's not right for for 90%. Now, let's just get the 10% that might be interested in this. Um, if you like movies like like this, for example, this horrible movies like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, this movie, it was just a glimpse, an artsy, fartsy glimpse as to the old L.A. It didn't go anywhere. Um, it just, I don't want to get into this. There's not, there, I didn't see too much truth in this movie. I had to like sit through it once I started watching it. I think, honestly, to me, it's Tarantino wrote this movie for, and I'll get back to Under the Silver Lake in a moment. He wrote it, I think, for just insiders. It gives an, a glimpse into what old Hollywood in the 70s was like. And I'm sure all the elites and everybody at the Eyes Wide Shut parties they, and um, the Roman Polanski parties, they're all, they just, they just, love and covet old Hollywood, what it was before um, when the population was down a bit, um, you know, be, what what it used to be, the, the romantics side of it. Um, there's this movie goes nowhere, but it, it's just one, it's like going back in time scene by scene, but made, to, in my opinion, for, for insiders. Um, no expense was spared. Every car that comes around the corner is from the early 70s, but it, it does, it, 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 people like it, if you ask people on the street if they like it, because they were told to like it. They were told how great it was. It's no really no different than Hamilton, the play. Um, most people on the street, oh yeah, that's a good movie, because they were told it was a good movie. If you are into this artsy stuff and a glimpse back in time and weird personal stories that go nowhere, then you're gonna if you like this and you've seen this and most people have seen this then you have a chance of liking this, all right? But this ain't gonna be for most people. So, um, guys, I'm not gonna do too much on the plot. It is just an all over the place mess. Um, just get into the most important stuff. I don't want to ramble on. This movie's just not worth it. Um, okay, the first 20, 30 minutes. He's just a obviously a struggling actor. They're he, he's getting threatened to be kicked out of his apartment in L.A. 
this car is being repossessed, has no money, his, wife, his mom keeps calling, how's work? Oh, work's fine, he's lying about his situation, meets this girl, it's like a Melrose Place, um, Los Angeles uh, apartment community with like 15 units or, or 20 or 30 units. But if you, if you know what I mean by that Melrose Place, just two floors, kind of all, an old feel, an old pool, old trees around it. It looks It's like a, more of a giant house than an apartment building. There's a lot of this in L.A., and that's, it's a very neat aspect of living in L.A. for a lot of people, this, this setting, which may interest some people. But meets this girl. She's larger than life. Somehow, you know, sleeps with her, fine, and she just disappears. Just next morning, her whole apartment's cleaned out, and he goes on this weird quest to find her. And it takes him into these weird places, and, it, and the main part of this movie, and why I'm covering, I should have gotten to it earlier, is it is a very, quote, to the outsider coming in crunching popcorn. It's a conspiracy theorist movie. All of a sudden, he starts seeing signs and symbols, and he has no background in this. And what do those signs and symbols mean? And people start showing up in his life, and the hobo king comes out of the woods and says this and that, and symbols, and he finds a guy that, that draws and creates comic book storyboards. And he's very, uh, well, there's a lot of truth in what he says, but of course he's made out to be a complete whack job, somebody with cameras all over his house, a tinfoil hat and all that, you know, that type of person. So whatever truth he delivers, the popcorn crunchers that watch the movie just don't look at it for truth. And that's kind of how this whole movie is set up. It's one of these movies that, first of all, it delivers a tremendous amount of truth. This movie does. But I'm only going to talk in a, about it in a few a few areas. Of course, on Reddit and all these places, oh, there's breakdowns in this movie, what all the symbolism means. I'm telling you, the, these are first grade truthers that are doing that. There's no reason to do it. It's most likely all these breadcrumbs put in this movie is led to mislead. When Somebody with your eyes or my eyes watch this, certain things pop out of us. But it's so weird and so bizarre. Trust me, there's no reason, there's no way I'm going to spend hours and hours and hours breaking down with the possible symbolism. It's it's just, this is it's a first grade truth exercise. But it, the movie's presented in a way that whatever the obvious truth comes out, the movie's so weird and it's the, the scenes are so strange with some creepy, uh, you know, bizarre tinfoil hat wearers and other. The hobo king comes out of the woods. That, that you, the popcorn crunchers would blow it off, and, and the, of course, the, wouldn't. There was no truth in movies delivered. And if you told them there was, they would say there's such a bizarre, cinematic, uh, psychedelic, weird experience that they would say, "Well, you're crazy. You're out of your mind." Truth of reality in movies. So that's what they do. When, when real truth comes out, and I know my message is kind of conflicting with real truth, but you're not going to, you did, you know, I didn't spend any time taking notes. I didn't rewind scenes. I'm just not going to do it. We're Whatever truth is coming out here, guys, we're way beyond it. We're way beyond it. This is for maybe a little bit of a su subliminal massaging of the unconscious mind or the subconscious mind for the popcorn crunchers. We're way, way beyond this. But let me just get into, for those that don't want to just keep hearing me ramble on without any real direction here, which is kind of weird. I, I don't know what to do with this movie. I try to make notes. It, it's just too all over the place weird. So I'm going to do this on the fly. This type of video is not going to be for everybody. But the great scene, let's just get right to the great, the absolute great scene in this movie. And I will leave links, um, for example, if you want to even... Stop it now and go over to the link and watch this first scene with the the music composer, the songwriter, um, and then hopefully you could come back. But this this is it's almost worth watching this movie for this scene. But I will leave you the link. Somebody on YouTube has just just captured the scene. So again, he is looking for this girl. He's running into all these signs and symbols for the first time. He's opening himself up to conspiracy theory, talking to different people, you know, and it is, again, for anybody interested in an artsy type movie that gives you a weird glimpse, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood did in this late 70s, gives you a weird glimpse of what a lot of LA is really like um, in, I don't, they don't really, they're not clear on the time. Sometimes things look very modern. 
So, and then the guy plays a Donkey Kong video, and it, and then the phone is a little bit more modern than the time period. I would say this is supposed to be set in the, I don't know, the mid-2000s, 2005 or so, or 2002, something like that. They're not real clear on it. I think that's on purpose. But maybe, you know, if you look at the Wikipedia, it might give a clear date, but I doubt it would. So it gives, it really gives you a sense of what living in L.A. is like for a certain type of person. It's very accurate. I lived there for three years, never had anything in place with the, com with the anything in common with the place or place with the common. Someone said, well, describe L.A. And somebody said, in a word, it's vague. And I was like, that's it. You know, that, if you had one word, and you, how do you describe Los Angeles in one word? I lived in East L.A., uh, basically a, in a Hispanic neighborhood where the, the, the top of the hill was, you know, there was like this one little gated apartment, um, mostly white people. But the bottom of the hill was just East L.A., the person that cut my hair. I never spoke to them in, in three years. They didn't speak a word of English. And I guess after... Well, I spoke some Spanish, but I, you know, just from what I learned in high school, I couldn't just sit down and have a full conversation, so we didn't speak to each other. And, um, you know, so I, I have a sense of it, but I wanted out. As soon as I was there for just a few months, I'm like, this. I have nothing in terms of vibration or frequency, nothing in common with this place. I went out, and somebody said, it's just, just describe it as, you can't describe L.A. in one word, but this is the only way to do it, vague. Whatever that means, there's no other way to do it in one word. Of course, you can't do it in one word, but I was there, by the way, between 1996 to 1999, 1996 to 1999, and knew immediately I just wanted out. I mean, horrible place to live. Once you do the touristy things for a few months, you're like, now I live here? Really? Ooh. And um, it's just like in, in Moonstruck, you know, she keeps asking... Um, the old the, um, the, the, the woman married to the plumber in Moonstruck, why do men chase women? You know, his husband's trying to run around with these, these. you know, it was an older man, his last fling, he's, he's pathetic, the women he's taking out are pathetic, she has a degree of dignity in Moonstruck, why, keeps, why, and then Johnny Camareri, it's Johnny Camareri, Johnny Camareri says, well, Loretta, maybe they fear death, and she's like, that's it, that's it, and he's, Johnny Camareri's an idiot, he's like, you got it, that's it, well, I don't know, Loretta, no, no, that's it, because they fear death. I. It's just a really interesting scene from Moonstruck. And I know that the Transpocalypse Army right now is coming. Thought, Did you know Cher is a man? In the, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. I know. Transpocalypse, Arm, Transpocalypse Army. Nothing is more important in the, in the universe than identifying a woman who presents themselves as a woman on television who is a man. There's nothing else in the universe more important than that. Everything comes second to that. If there was... Um, you know, some remember in um in um what was the movie with the um oh forget it. Just, I gotta move on. I gotta get back to this creepy fest. Um so just different parties and but let me get back to again the most important the absolute most important scene. Is it up here? Yeah. Okay, so he's in this these symbols, lead him here, lead him there. He's learning about a whole under belly of reality and and again people are going well that sounds pretty darn interesting it's it is not worth seeing for most people it really isn't and if you even attempt to see this guys you need to love this actor you know he can be kind of whiny and creepy and kind of you have to think he's kind of cool and cute it, he's just you have to really like this guy to put up with this movie if you're not sure forget about it but one thing one quest leads him um to and i'm not going to show you there's this group that keeps popping up at the local clubs where he goes. Jesus and the uh, vampire slayers, as the girls that sing around, he presents himself as Jesus as a mockery, but then there's the vampire girls, whatever. It's just some local two-bit band that's coming up. And there is supposedly this hidden messages, and somebody tells him about backmasking, so he spends all this time listening to a record going backwards. And finally... This guy does take action, though, in this regard, and it's, it's, it's a pleasant surprise in the movie when he takes such blatant action. He just goes in, finds this guy who's, who's the lead singer who says he's Jesus, and of course, he, for, he's a big fish in a small pond in the local club scene, so he gets all the girls, but he's not Eddie Vedder or anything. He's a thousand steps lower, big fish in a small pond, and he basically like, punches this guy, jacks him up, punches him in the face, saying, tell me 
the, tell me the meaning in these songs. There is meaning here. I've studied them. I've back, you're backmasking. Tell me the meaning in song this, A, B, and C. And the guy looks up at him. He's like, and he's just some wuss. He's been punched in the face. He's like, I, I didn't write those three. It's like, what you? You're the lead singer of the of this popular band, and you didn't write the music. Well, I wrote this one and this one, but the record company gave me these, and it's the biggest. It's just the absolute truth drop. That is what happens with almost every artist, every artist. And I will get to this guy in a second, guys. Let me just put his creepy face up. This is the greatest scene in the movie. I'm gonna. The first link I put under this video will be this guy. So, he he's got this this lead singer is on the ground and he, he's punched him. I didn't write those. I, mean, I don't know what they mean. They were just record company just said to include them, but they turned out to be your biggest hits. Well, yeah, but well, who wrote them? Well, I don't know. I just, I've heard stories about this guy that lives up in the Hollywood Hills or something. So he has a vague address or he goes on this other quest during the whole, it's one of the funny things that I guess it's kind of a mini mockery that his car is repossessed. He, he's about to be kicked out of his apartment. But he goes all over L.A. on foot. I mean, you just can't do that. That's the, it's the one city in the world where, you know, you want to go from uh, Torrance to uh, Silver Lake or up to Pasadena. It's like a 30-minute drive to get to different parts of L.A. You don't go anywhere on foot for the most part. He's like walking all over like it's, it's walkable. Like um, San Francisco is very walkable. If you live south of Market, you could walk up to the... Uh, Mission District or, you know, Haight-Ashbury would be quite a hike, but you could do it. L.A. is completely not walkable. It's 30-minute drive. It's 70 miles an hour to get to certain part to part. In Orange County, or that shit, forget that. That's all day shit. So so they, he walks all over. So anyway, he finally comes up to this, this wall, these gates, and he's going to climb the gates, of course, gets in there. And it's basically, it's like he's approaching the devil. This is, a, this is a, the way it's presented to the popcorn crunchers is this is like the devil and he comes into uh, I, there's not a good picture of it this is i guess the best way to go about it this one comes into this guy's mansion hollywood hills you know has five seven acres at the hollywood hills which is you know nobody has land up there i mean it's just this you know you're talking about huge wealth although the place itself is not ridiculously opulent and in this room here where he's at the piano, there's all these beautiful guitars, Gibsons, and Fenders, and different instruments, and it's really an, an amazing scene. I will. The first link will be this, and it, I'll just give you an, in, a, in a nutshell what he says. It comes out, and he's like, yeah, you heard this this Jesus and the vampires or whatever? Yeah, I didn't. I wrote that. But basically, but I wrote every. He says, I, I wrote everything. Well, you know, if you, if you know it, and it's, it's, it's a big, I wrote it. He's like, what? You, you wrote, he's like, you think you, you like who you like. Like, I like Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. He's like, yeah, I wrote it. And he does it on the piano. Dun, 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 dun. He does it on the piano. And he's like, and your favorite uh, love song from Foreigner. I want to know what love is. He starts, he just goes piano. Every 10 seconds, he's doing a, a riff you recognize on the piano. And he's like, I wrote it. Now, it is a, it's just a, you know, it's a, it, no, the truth drop, it's not even subtle. I mean, it's absolutely 100% true. Just my favorite example of all time is always Sarah McLachlan. You know, surfacing, the album Surfacing. Um, first song, Building a Mystery. She's 29 years old, but all these occult uh, references, esoteric references, as above, so below. Um, will we, what does one of the songs say? Will we burn in heaven like we do down here? I mean, come on. It's 29-year-old Sarah McLachlan. She didn't know shit about shit. She didn't write that. She was handed that. And that's the message that comes out uh, from, from this guy. Now, what they do, again, in, in, in a movie like this, is the scenes are so strange, so creepy. You see how he looks here? And he, whoever plays this, um, I didn't know the actor, when I looked it up, but he does an excellent, absolute excellent job. Over the top personality, he really obnoxious in your face. It's a young actor playing an old guy, so it's all kind of presented like a cartoon or a caricature, an over the top caricature to the popcorn crunchers. So they don't really believe it, you know. Oh, this guy wrote this, and it wouldn't be one guy that wrote it. It would be, um, you know, uh, that team, that Tavistock team of which some of the names you know, 
like uh, John Williams, who did, who, direct, who did the the music score for Star Wars, and uh, Hans Zimmer. I mean, this, the, people like John Williams, Hans Zimmer. Um, I forget some of the other names, but Hans Zimmer is is just a musical genius. If you just watch his, his introduction to his master class or whatever the advertisement is for those fraudulent master classes, absolute geniuses. Well, they have the the system itself through Tavistock and, and these other groups have five of these guys or people you don't know. And Pearl Jam, you know, the first, oh, what a coincidence. All the grunge movement, they came out of the same they all lived like right down the block from each other. Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, um, Soundgarden. Oh, just just what a coincidence! All came out of the same city. Pearl Jam puts out uh, Pearl Jam versus Incredible. No, Ten is the first one with Jeremy. Jeremy spoke. You know that and um, all Alive and all those songs. It's incredible. I mean, best if you like grunge, it's just it just really doesn't get any better. Then versus. Don't call me daughter. You know, all those incredible, incredible, incredible. Then, see, then they're left on their own by this guy, this guy that represents the writers for the system itself. And they put out stinkers, absolute crap. Vitology had some decent stuff, but it was crap compared to the first two. So I think they were just left kind of on their own. And then no code and absolute shit. Absolute shit. And the level of music writing goes from a 10 down to about a two with Pearl Jam. There are exceptions, I believe, like Bono, I believe, is an exception, where the lead man really can write. He's an absolute scum of the earth, and his charity puts 99% of the money they collect back into the charity and back into their own $5,000 dinners. Jimmy Page is probably an exception. There are, certainly are exceptions, but this, is, this guy's scene is exactly how the industry works 95% of the time, in my opinion. Sarah McLaughlin, and you could just go down the list. I mean, even, again, I think he even sings, I think it is Foreigner, like, do you want to know what love, all those types of ballads, they all come from the system itself, in my opinion. And he's, of course, like, no way, you know, no way, man, you're lying. Kurt Cobain really wrote that. <laughs> and, you know, the popcorn crunchers don't know really what to make. And this is like, oh, this is just some artsy movie about L.A. They don't really, really understand that real truth is being delivered, but, you know, he has a realization moment, which really, not that we needed to any sort of proof that this is actually the truth. We knew this is how the music industry works, but it never has been so blatantly admitted in a movie than in this scene, and I wouldn't even be doing this review if it weren't for this scene. It is really good, and I'll link to it, but honestly, for 90% more of you, once you've seen this scene, you know, this movie is... It's not worth watching. It really isn't. But I, guys, I had personal synchronicities when I watched this. Like, maybe it's worth watching for that. Like, is there some metaphysical weird thing going on with people that watch it? If they're really in tune with their own synchronicities, and I'll tell you what it is. Um, the where's the hobo code? All right, he comes to this as he's pursuing his signs and symbols. Um, this code keeps appearing here. The two diamonds. Uh, bound together, and uh, I guess Lavette would have a field day with this, um, but I don't know if this is real. It's probably made up for the movie, The Hobo Code. Hobos leave signs for each other, like this one, Hobo Danger, um, Keep Quiet is the first one that comes up. The two, but again, guys, this isn't this isn't my thing, all right? They're not, it's two diamonds next to each other, and the, the t alchemical symbol sim symbolism, guys, is not my thing. When I see this, I see IXXI, but um, or double a double X or something related to Saturn. But again, this is not like I shouldn't even go there in terms of like here's somebody that has a damn tattoo of it. <laughs> I shouldn't even go there. That is not my. This is not my pathway into truth. And whenever I try to pretend like I know what I'm talking about here, I end up looking stupid. So he's pursuing this symbol here, and um, I'm like. What's this? I'm drinking a brand new beer. I got a um, to try a, a twelve pack at the uh, distributor. I'm like, what is this new beer? And I'm, and I'm at literally as he's pursuing the symbol. I'm drinking this beer I've never drunk before, never heard of it before, and always like trying a new IPA or the real heavy stuff. I'll drink like one a night, starting like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I can drink one of these heavy beers. 
and then I usually just go to my light beer crap. But I'm like, is it the same symbol on the beer that I'm drinking? Well, it's first of all, I look at it, it's called Hobo Brewing Company. I'm like, it's this is the this guy's pursuing the hobo code, and this beer out of the blue, I'm, I'm drinking Hobo Life, Lord Hobo, Hobo Brewing Company, Life, Life Matrix, Life Session I, IPA. Um, and this symbol is very similar to what he's pursuing in the movie. And I'm like, this is just, it's a little creepy. Again, guys, hobo code in the movie, a beer I've never drunk before. I look down, the symbol's very similar. Like, okay, this is a little, you know, is it the most amazing thing that ever happened to anybody? No. But um, the other thing was when he goes into, uh, where's the scene where, God, there's a lot of strange scenes with this cult group. and I don't even know how to get into this. But... Um, this is almost indescribable how what what's going on with the, with this cult here. But it does talk about uh, soul ascension, things like that. I, I don't even know how to describe it. But the girl he's pursuing is in this cult, and um, she's he says is buried under tons and tons of concrete, and he can't get to her. She's sealed, but she's alive down there. It's very hard to describe what's going on. She's under tons and tons of concrete. And I think I just watched the Howie McCoskey, you know, the, the channel I recommended, and he said something about the bishop's tomb. Why would they pour 5,000 pounds of concrete over the tomb? And she's entombed, but a lot. So that synchronicity was there as well. But to have two personal synchronicities in this movie that's about following synchronicities and is about following code and symbols, you know, so I wonder if, I wonder... And I don't think so, guys. I don't want to give this movie any credit. I don't want to encourage anybody to watch it that isn't interested. But, I mean, it's just a one in a million that could this movie be set up as such that if somebody's really tuned in when they watch it, there's there's so many things going on that they will actually find a personal synchronicity to themselves. And again, this, this movie's a creep show. Um but there's this scene that he comes upon this cult there. What it, we're preparing for our, our, our soul ascension. We, and this, there's some really interesting truth in this scene. I don't know if I can find it, but he's, but this guy says, who would want to spend, basically says, who would want to spend a second more than they have to in this place? You know, we want to get out of here or ascend, but you get the sense this is, he keeps coming upon minions. I don't get the sense whatever spiritual process these people are trying to follow um, I see it more along the lines of what George Soros could do here, or what we describe to be the minions, people more bound to this place or bound to this universe, where I, as I was watching this, I was like, oh, I hope, I never I never thought this at all, like, oh, I hope that my spiritual or soul self could ascend the way what this guy wants to do. I felt like he was like a lower being trying to do the best that he could, like a minion level, like stuck here. So, you know, again, like, you and I watch this, and we just would look at these like almost arrogantly, like these are just, even though, you know, they're you're convinced these people know what they're doing because there's so much weird stuff that happens in the movie. Like they're not just a cult, you know, group that's just going to drink the Kool Aid and worship a head of lettuce. That they're you you get the feeling that that they're not just deluding themselves. That they they are they know do know what they're doing, and they do know what they're doing because he puts he puts you know, this guy back in touch with the girl he's pursuing, and she is in this tomb, uh, but there, it's, it's like an apartment down there. There's just a lot of weird metaphysical things that can't be described going on, but you watch this, and you're like, oh, you, you don't covet it if you're like a real person. You're like, it's a, it's a lower level down from us. I'm not describing this well, and I know I'm making people interested in this movie by talking about it, and I don't, you shouldn't be, unless there's certain things that, you know, that you like the artsy-fartsy and this whole theme that runs through the movie, beware the dog killer, um, is the uh, huge symbolism. Um, it's everywhere. Everywhere, you, there's, there's supposedly somebody killing dogs. Everywhere, uh, there's signs, beware the dog killer, beware the dog killer. Somebody painted it, and this woman's trying to get it off the, the restaurant window. And people are afraid to walk their dog. And uh, he has dreams where a woman will come around the corner and just bark at him. And the, because this movie is set up to be the weird uh, esoteric uh, LSD or DMT trip that it is. There is huge symbolism here, but I don't care to, to really study it or I don't care what it is. Again, guys, whatever symbolism is going to come through here, we're way past it. 
We're way past it in terms of where we are. So I don't, I don't care. Oh, Matt, oh, that's, it has to be related to Sirius or God spelled backwards. Yeah, yeah, I know all that. It doesn't, who cares, really? It, it, it's not worth studying. You can go to Reddit. You can, there, there are these websites that have this whole movie broken down, and you just spend about a minute on these websites, and you're like, this is, you know, in terms of our journey or journey through truth or spiritual journey, I don't, again, mean to sound arrogant, but these are like first graders, you know, you spend if you spend any time at all on this movie breaking it down some movies are worth breaking it down like 2001 a space odyssey it's first your first grader so i got the sense immediately that i'm gonna watch it Remember, there's some blatant truth but there's no way i'm gonna spend time on this bull crap which is it was it's just in my opinion this movie is meant it's meant to massage any tiny little truth instinct that may be somewhere hit, buried inside of a popcorn cruncher just to get them if there's any real aspect of them left to get them thinking in a little bit different way and anybody saying well matt that sounds like they're they're trying to help us this these minion assholes and this evil that you ter- describe all the time is trying to help us well yeah they, they, they do both i mean we know that well how do you think a movie like dances with wolves gets made it's just made on the down low and they, the, oh, the Minions went crazy, Then, but it was already in all the AMC theaters and Regal theaters, and they couldn't do anything about it. No, they they have, the, this Minion system ha, has to deliver truth in certain areas. Why is that? We, I keep, we're not, I'm not even going to mention anymore why that is. We keep going, it's not worth figuring out. They, we know they have to do it. Is it to, to reduce their their karma load? Is it because that is they know their role that they're playing here? They're allowed to suck the energy to maintain their 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 livelihoods and their sentience, feeding off the energy of real people as long as they provide a means for real people to find the truth. There's all again, all of this is on the table. We'll never really know why they do it. It's just all that's important is to know that they do. Okay, and they do. So um but so so again, anyway, guys, like so, it, it is meant to kind of get the popcorn crunchers thinking, and some you know, like think, well, is, could that be true? Or just a little bit of a, it's like training wheels. First time your parent puts you on a plastic bicycle with training wheels. That's what this movie is, I think, for the popcorn crunchers. And maybe there's some, you know, and the minions probably like, ah, yeah, we're forced to have another movie that might wake a few people up. Ah, we we got to put the yeah, we got to put it out. We got to do it. It's not like they, oh, we really love, uh, the Minions say, we really love the masses, and we, we're re- I know we screw them, but we're just doing it for them. No, no, there's, uh, you know, I've always said that is their, their to, a, to a degree, that is their role. That is their role. You know, they're, 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 they didn't build this place. They were put here to play the asshole role. And truth has to be delivered through them. But they don't, you know, they don't shed a tear for us. There's some truth channels that like, oh, we really should applaud them. No, no. Again, like the guy trying to immunize himself from from poison, from a venom, he might put little snakes in his arm and get bit on purpose. The snake biting him isn't trying to help him. The snake biting him is serving a purpose so he can um, create a, um, a resistance to the venom. He's using the snake. We're using the system. For spiritual progression, we're using the assholes. There's only two type of people here: people being used by the system, which is most people, and people that finally can figure out how to use it. And we're figuring that out. Thanks, guys.